This is Channel 3 Eyewitness News. First up right now at 5 o'clock, the autumn nor'easter has moved out, but the damage has already been done. That is for sure. Cities and towns really across the state are cleaning up after getting slammed with gusty winds and heavy rain. Channel 3 New Haven Bureau Chief Matt McFarland begins our team coverage tonight from Old Saybrook, where crews have been removing debris all day. Matt, they still have a lot of work ahead of them. Uh, yeah, there still are uh, out there working. Uh, now here on Oil Main Street here in Old Saybrook, power's out for a number of hours uh, this morning into the afternoon. It's back, but uh, this was one spot right here. You can see the tree, uh, a large limb rotted out, came crashing down, wiping out power. And this was just one of a number of spots here across town. Towering trees rocking back and forth as leaves and branches whip in the wind. The wind is always wicked here. We're right off the marsh, so we always get the wind. I have... Uh, a bunch of tall pines in my backyard. I just got done uh, cleaning them up from the last two storms. And last night and this morning, Robert Arcone and his neighbors on Forest Glen Road in Old Saybrook had to weather through another one, a nor'easter that brought driving rain and damaging winds. My wife gets very nervous. She worries and gets up and looks around and all. I, I can sleep right through it. I'm, <laughs> I'm that way. On their road, power was out after part of a tree snapped off, taking out a wire. Driving around town, you didn't have to look far to see the remnants of the storm and the cleanup. Tree limbs stacked up and off the side of the road. A busted fence. While on Main Street, public works crews got to work, hauling off this huge limb that cut power to businesses, with utility crews right behind them getting to work. Back on Forest Glen, Robert says he turned out pretty lucky, just picking up a few chairs in this American flag display made from a pallet that the wind picked up and pushed over last night. That thing is heavy. It is heavy. So for the wind to blow it over last night, that's a strong wind. That's a strong wind. The wind is always pretty wicked around here. So I'm just glad I don't have any more trees down. And the wind is still whipping here in Old Saybrook. Now, getting all those trees picked up, that's just one part of the work that needed to be done. The other part, getting the power back on, that part of the story, coming up tonight at 6. We're live with the mobile newsroom in Old Saybrook. Matt McFarland, Channel 3, Eyewitness News. Still windy there for sure, Matt. Thank you very much. Well, the high winds left a lot of hazards as well out on the roads. Uh, take a look at this right here. A fallen limb pierced right through the windshield of an SUV. It happened on 395, uh, 395 rather, this morning in Montfort. Phil. This is uh, very, very scary and could be very, very uh, dangerous. It came within a few inches of the driver. Now, fortunately here, no one was hurt, but state police always urging everyone to be extra careful when you're out during a storm. And this was quite uh, the storm with winds gusting as high as 70 miles an hour and uh, nearly five and a half inches of rain, especially in southwestern Connecticut in the town of Wilton. So at the U.S. Car the US Coast Guard Academy in New London, right on a, a pier adjacent to the uh, academy, a wind gust to 70 miles an hour was measured. However, you get out there toward Martha's Vineyard, Edgar Town had a gust to 94 miles an hour at Wellfleet, a gust to 82 miles an hour. New Haven had a gust of 55, Greenwich 54, Bridgeport a gust to 48, Norwalk 47, and Hammond Asset a gust to 45 miles an hour. So quite the windy day today, and now the winds are, are a little bit lighter. It's still quite breezy out there. Average wind speeds are 10 to 20 miles an hour, and recently Willimantic and Groton had gusts to over 30 miles an hour, but these gusts are not as brutal as they were earlier today. Early warning pinpoint top shows that we don't have any heavy rain in the state, but in other parts of the state, there is some light rain and some mist making for a dreary evening. And you can see we're on the backside of that storm now. A huge nor'easter starting to pull away from New England and off to our west. We have nice clear skies, which will be moving in as we go through tonight. So as we step out the door tomorrow morning, the sky is going to be mainly clear. Tomorrow's looking great. The end of the week and the weekend, well, not so much. I'll let you know when we'll see our next rainstorm coming up in the early warning forecast. All right, we'll see you then, Bruce. Thank you very much. All new tonight, a busy intersection in Middletown is back open after a deadly crash this morning. An SUV slammed into a utility pole at South Main Street and Randolph Road and went right into the woods there. The driver has been identified as 60-year-old James Henderson of Middletown. He was pronounced dead at the hospital.
Tonight at 5 on the Answer Desk, how is the state getting ready to vaccinate your children? The CDC could actually give the okay by this time next week for kids between 5 and 11. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Mike Savino asked the governor about how our state is getting ready for all of this. He's joining us live right now from the Yukon Health Center with more on this. Mike. Yes, Mark, as we've heard before, the governor said that primarily he expects people to go to their pediatricians to get their kids vaccinated, but not everybody has a pediatrician and not every doctor's office can handle this demand. So what is the state doing for those families to help them find a shot? We're working hard now with the um, five to 12 year old um, age group. Um, now that that's been um, about to be uh, formally approved. Governor Ned Lamont isn't waiting around for the FDA and CDC to approve kids as young as five getting the COVID vaccine. The CDC is poised to give the final green light next week. So what is the state doing in the meantime? We've already placed our order for a thousand, a uh, hundred thousand of those vaccines. Kids ages five to 12 can get vaccines in four locations, according to plans released Tuesday by the Department of Public Health. This includes pediatricians. But what about families who can't go to their doctor for the vaccine or don't have one? We want to make sure that there are enough options and availability for parents to be able to choose what's going to work best for them. Other possible sites include pharmacies, school-based clinics, and clinics held by healthcare systems and local health departments. I think that schools will take advantage of setting up um, uh, clinics wherever they can. Some pediatricians will likely look to volunteer at some of these clinics. President Biden has also said he wants a public education campaign around vaccines for children. What role will schools play? The school leaders and um, educators are going to be sharing it with families, not with individual children. Will parents need to make an appointment first? Doctors say that could depend on the provider, but they still have some advice. It would be good to at least call ahead and make sure that they do have the child's dose. Now, it's still not clear just how quickly that vaccine would become available if it's approved next week. But here at the Yukon Health Center, they say they're already making plans for a pediatric clinic as soon as possible. They're also already starting to work with towns to help them out. Live from Farmington, Mike Savino, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. All right, a lot of good information there, Mike. Thank you very much. All new tonight at 5, a violent new Netflix show has parents and teachers on high alert. It's called Squid Game, and here are three things you need to know. The popular show out of South Korea started streaming last month and quickly became Netflix's biggest original series. Squid Game focuses on cash-strapped people trying to win money by playing children's games that get violent and turn deadly. It's an adult show, but kids are watching it and in some cases reenacting the behavior on the school playground. Channel 3's chief digital anchor Kara Sunland digs deeper into the concern. It's a little bit different than just red light, green light, right? You know, it was it a red light, green light, and then students fall down and act like they, you know, were killed, you know, as imitation of Squid Game. In the new Netflix show Squid Game, contestants compete in children's games like red light, green light, for the chance at a large cash prize, but the stakes are deadly. This week, families at an elementary school minutes from the Connecticut border in Chicopee, Massachusetts, got a letter from the principal alerting them that kids are reenacting some scenes from the show at recess. I jumped on YouTube to watch the trailer um, and was a bit shocked uh, at the content uh, of the, or the mature content of the TV show. The school is now working with families to discourage this kind of violent play, which school officials say is fueled by social media. In some cases, Squid Game knockoffs are popping up on the Roblox gaming platform, popular with young children. The negative influence of social media. Parents are concerned about this kind of behavior spreading through schools. To tell the truth, it does sound very disturbing. Um, I think, you know, it's time to kind of step in as parents and kind of watch social media and kind of watch what they're watching. He says this is something he plans to address with his own kindergartner and third grader. Anytime it's dealing with any violence, any death threats, any sexual abuse threats, yes, um, definitely. It will be something that will be talked about and I feel that should be talked about with your other children also. Kara Sundlin, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Now we did reach out to school leaders in Connecticut. While they say they haven't seen the issue popping up here, they are aware of it and are keeping a very close eye on it.
Still ahead for you right here at five new revelations on a deadly movie set shooting. What investigators found here at the scene and new questions coming out about one of the crew members involved. This is a race uh, against time. Reinvesting in the rent, major concerns about one of the state's biggest sports venues as it literally falls apart Why the future of the aging facility is far from certain. 20 towns in 20 days. We're in Wallingford today and we're at Guave Vineyards and inside this time where it's a little warmer and in the tasting room. But it's more than a tasting room. We'll tell you about this coming up. We are learning new details about the deadly shooting on the set of the Alec Baldwin movie Rust. Investigators in New Mexico now say they have recovered the bullet that killed a cinematographer and injured the director. The incident happened last week as Baldwin was rehearsing a scene with a gun he was told was not loaded. Police also say they recovered other real bullets on set but would not comment on how they got there. There is still no word on who could be held accountable. We can't say that it was negligent by whom, negligence by whom, how many people were involved. We can't say that with any certainty at this point. We have also learned the woman in charge of the weapons on set had been accused of mishandling guns on a previous film she worked on starring Nicolas Cage. Back here tonight, Eversource customers will see some lower bills in the coming months. Certainly some good news. State regulators approve the so-called Eversource Accountability Plan, which will return $103 million to customers. The agreement directs $65 million to be returned in the form of two credits, one in December, the other in January. The average bill will drop by about $35. The remaining $28 million is already being deducted from bills. The decision follows Eversource's inadequate response to Tropical Storm Isaias. Also new tonight, the U.S. Postal Service is preparing for what's expected to be a record holiday rush. It is hiring more than 40,000 seasonal workers to handle more than 50 million packages a day. The Postal Service says it's hoping to avoid repeating last year's catastrophe. It was hit with a serious worker shortage because so many employees were home due to COVID, and that led to a lot of mail delays. COVID definitely changed the way that people shop and that changed the way that people use the mail even further.
The post office says it also has new sorting machines that process the mail up to 12 times faster than before. Now, Channel 3, early warning weather. Well, so weather conditions are certainly a lot better than they were earlier today, but we have to wait uh, until tomorrow to get into the really good weather. Sue took this uh, picture a little while ago in Mystic, where it's still cloudy and windy, but uh, weather conditions are not as blustery as they were earlier today. And it was southeastern Connecticut that really got uh, hit hard with winds uh, gusting to over uh, 60 miles an hour. In fact, at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, Augusta 70 miles an hour was measured. All right, rainfall totals, uh, well, they were pretty impressive. Impressive. You can see that early warning pinpoint Doppler for now is showing there's not much rain in the state. But despite the fact that we're not picking up on much rain, there are, are areas of drizzle, areas of light rain, certainly enough for the windshield wipers to uh, be going out there. And here are the rainfall totals. Look how Wilton hit the jackpot with nearly five and a half inches. Bethany, 4.64 inches, ranging to about 2.27 inches in uh, Weathersfield. And uh, other rainfall totals include Danbury at 4.81, Litchfield 2.28, and Jeff in Staffordville, not quite up to two inches, uh, 1.88 inches. So rainfall across the state ranged anywhere from an inch and a half to five and a half inches with southwestern Connecticut really hitting the uh, jackpot. So Hartford now is uh, overcast, misty, and 53 degrees. There's a raw wind out there as well. You can see the wind is still whipping in New London, but not as intense as it was a few hours ago and earlier today. It's 51 there with the wind out of the north at 18 miles an hour. So you can see that we have temperatures mostly between 50 and 55. New Haven, Bridgeport, you're the warm spots at 57. Putnam, you're one of the chilliest locations in the state with a current temperature of 47. And with that to north to northeasterly flow out there around the backside of that storm, it is mighty chilly. Look at Boston coming in at 49 degrees right now. So we're still on the tail end of this storm, but the center of this massive nor'easter is now moving away to the south and east of New England. And as it continues to pull away tonight, high pressure is going to build in. And this uh, clearer sky that you see off to our north and west, that's going to be moving in tonight. You can see that on Futurecast. After some evening clouds and areas of light, rain and drizzle, the sky will become mainly clear overnight. Now tomorrow, with kind of a northeasterly flow, there could be some clouds in eastern Connecticut, but I think most of the state is going to be mostly sunny. With high pressure in place, the wind is going to be a lot lighter too. And then as we get into a Friday, we'll have some morning sunshine. Clouds take over during the afternoon, the late afternoon, and especially Friday night. That's when the rain starts to move in. And according to the European model, the coastal storm will deliver more rain on Saturday, but not nearly as much a wind and rain as what we just got through. So here's Saturday morning periods of rain, uh, still some rain and drizzle in the afternoon. Going ahead into Sunday, it looks like we'll have a few showers in the afternoon, but it's not going to be as wet as Saturday. So some good news there. All right, so lows tonight in the 40s, some upper 30s in the cool spots and highs tomorrow are going to range from 55 to 60 degrees. Here's your seven day forecast and Friday clouding up kind of a raw day with highs in the 50s. And then Saturday, periods of rain, drizzle and fog, a high of 59. There is a chance for a couple of showers on Halloween on Sunday in the afternoon. Hopefully they'll be gone by evening, 63. Monday and Tuesday look great, partly to mostly sunny skies, 60 to 65, and a chance for some uh, more rain, maybe even a, a little bit of mixed precipitation in the hills come late Wednesday into Wednesday night. We'll be uh, watching that one uh, closely for the shoreline tomorrow. A nice day, sunny and 60. Bruce, thank you. It is time to get back now to 20 towns in 20 days, and tonight we are in Wallingford. Yes, Channel 3's Kevin Hogan has been spending the afternoon with some wine. He's at Gouveia Vineyards. He's also with a lot of nice people and a nice fire right and there. And a beautiful fire. Yeah. Hey, Kevin. Yeah, it's a lot warmer, Mark and Aaron, than it was uh, the last half hour when we were joining you. And that cover, you know, Frank, mm -hmm. that went right to my head. Why? Um, our uh, wines have low in sulfites, uh, so it's not meant to be on the shelf for a very long period of time. It's a very, um, just a short shelf life, so it's very fresh, um, raw ingredients. Uh, we also use that Cabernet Franc in our Stonehouse Red, okay. uh, which is our blend. And this one does great with, for aerating, and um, the more that you let the action get in, the more that the flavor is really um, robust. And this is Addison Gouvet uh, Getcomb. Uh, so you've been here since day one. Yeah. And the production here is amazing. So this is the tasting room, and there's more behind the fireplace on the other side, but there's production facility downstairs. 
Correct. Yeah. So everywhere that you see, um, there's even including the patio that we just built, the entire thing is our production site. So everything is made on site. Um, we also only sell on site as uh, as well. Part of that reason is because of the low sulfites um, in our wine. The, the wines don't have a long shelf life. And also, too, we want to really encourage people to come into our facility. We want to see everyone. We want to make the memories. Right. Um, the, the, uh, the structure is beautiful. Um, it's all that timber frame, very natural woods and stone and more importantly the tables are set up for people to come together as one um, where communities you, know, you come as strangers and you leave together as friends yeah, thank you Addison it's a beautiful place and coming up uh, next half hour Aaron and Mark we're going to take you downstairs to that production facility here at uh, the vineyards uh, live at the mobile newsroom for 20 towns in 20 days Kevin Hogan Channel 3 Eyewitness News all right Kevin thank you very much Still ahead for you right here at 5, making your trip through an airport hopefully a little easier. Some new technology and airlines rolling out to cut down your time in line. Then some new details emerging on a wild police shootout in Norwich. What we're learning about the suspect who opened fire on officers and the calls to protect our communities from violence. Well, Delta Airlines is rolling out new technology to speed up your trip through the airport. It would be the first airline to offer full curb to gate security centered around facial recognition. You'd be able to get your baggage tag, breeze through security and board your flight all with a quick scan of your face. And really hopefully reduce stress and increase the speed at which people traverse through the airport. Members of Delta's loyalty program SkyMiles, who upload passport details and have TSA pre-check, can soon do this. It'll be a gradual rollout, though, and it won't be available at Bradley just yet. 
All right, our ICAM in Torrington shows some beautiful colors in the trees right now. And I was out in Waterbury today. I saw some beautiful color in the Waterbury area. So we're getting uh, close to a peak in uh, some parts of the state. And tomorrow with the sunshine, it's going to look even nicer out there for the day ahead. Mostly sunny starting out 40 to 45, reaching the mid and upper 50s in the afternoon. It's nice to see that sun. And for the shoreline, a chilly morning, 40s. And then upper 50s to near 60 during the afternoon. Mark will let you know how long the nice weather will last coming up in the early warning forecast on Eyewitness News at 530. Mike check test. We are back right now with 20 towns in 20 days in the wonderful town of Wallingford. Channel 3's Wendell Edwards is here right now with some fun facts about the great community. 20 towns in 20 days, the fall edition. We are in Wallingford today. I just spoke with Ray Andrewson from the local chamber, and he told me why Wallingford is just so wonderful in the fall. Okay, Ray, the best place to leave Pete. Oh boy, it's so gorgeous. You feel like you're in Vermont. Mackenzie Reservoir and Tyler Mill Preserve on the east side of Wallingford is beautiful. Okay, best fall activity here. Take the family, definitely. Trail of Terror. Uh, it's really spooky, and it is open on weekends around Halloween. Perfect. What do people do here then every fall? Ah, eat. Uh, go to Neil's Donuts, an iconic donut shop. Have an apple crisp donut with your coffee or your apple cider. It is great. Delicious. Here's a historical fact. Did you know we have an elephant buried here in Wallingford? It actually came through here in the 1940s and is buried. I can even take you to the site near a very special place in town. And that site now is the electric company? Yes, it is. Okay. Get a charge out of that. <laughs> I asked him the one word he would use to describe Wallingford in the fall, and he said quaint. He called it classic New England, where everyone just embraces the spirit of the season. In Wallingford, Wendell Edwards, Channel 3, Eyewitness News.
Two incidents in two cities involving shots fired at a police officer. Now some are calling for changes in the criminal justice system. COVID vaccines are now approved for children, but should parents be forced to get their children vaccinated? We have the latest on that debate. And while the storm is moving out, the cleanup is not done. We're going to check out the damage left behind by this fall nor'easter. Connecticut's number one local news. This is Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight at 530. I'm Erin Connolly. And I'm Mark Zinni. We have a lot to cover for you right now. Quite a difference from 24 hours ago, that's for sure, when a nor'easter was in full effect. And today the focus was on the cleanup. It was cleanup time in many parts of the state. Uh, this was Old Saybrook earlier this morning. As of late this afternoon, about 7,000 Eversource and United Illuminating customers were still without power. We want to kick things off and head right over to meteorologist Mark Dixon and see what is in store for us next. Mark. Uh, some big improvements over the next 24 hours. The wind certainly has been a big factor today, leading to those wind gusts that led to the power outages. But you can see the gusts have come down a bit, uh, only between, say, 25 and 35 miles an hour. And that will be a trend that continues this evening. They'll continue to slacken or get, get much less intense. Here's a look at the most recent sustained winds across the state between 10 and 20 miles an hour. It's all on the back side of this nor'easter, uh, you can see the counterclockwise spin uh, to the southeast of Nantucket, and this is going to be moving away. So even the showers that are across eastern Massachusetts and the Cape and Islands all will be moving out. So this evening you may encounter a little lingering drizzle on a few spots. Uh, perhaps you've seen a few breaks in the clouds in your community. So as the sun is setting, some more breaks will be possible. Our view from uh, Middletown showing still a lot of cloud cover, but the general theme this evening will be for the cloud cover to move out from west to east, going mainly clear tonight setting the stage for a beautiful day tomorrow. Certainly a dry, brighter day. Temperature wise for our Thursday, uh, we're looking for temperatures to bottom out in the uh, 40s. Uh, so 7 o'clock in the morning, mid 40s for most of the state. We're heading into the low and mid 50s by lunchtime and then upper 50s inland near 60 at the shoreline by 5 p.m. tomorrow. So uh, a pretty nice day, closer to average for this time of year. And you'll want to enjoy it because big changes are yet again in store. We've been talking about it uh, for several days now. Another storm will impact the Halloween weekend. The very latest on what to expect for trick or treating all ahead in the early warning seven day. All right, we'll see you in a few minutes, Mark. Thank you very much. Other news for you right now. There are a lot of concerns tonight after shots were fired at two police officers in two cities. Now, the officers were not hurt, but they were targeted. Yeah, they certainly were. And one of the suspects has a lengthy criminal past, raising questions about how he was still out on the streets. Chief political reporter Susan Raff is live tonight at the state capitol. And Susan, what are you learning about all of this? Well, it seems definitely that these officers were targeted. One of them was shot in Norwich, the other in Hartford. And it is the Hartford incident that is the most troubling because just about everyone we spoke to today is wondering why this man was out on the streets in the first place. A Hartford police officer was sitting in her cruiser on Main Street early Tuesday morning when a man approached the car and started firing. The bullet shattered the window but missed the officer. Shortly after, this man was arrested, Jose Cahigas. He's been arrested 13 times for attempted murder and three gun charges. Why they're on the street is beyond me, and we're going to get to the bottom of it. They should not be out in the street, those folks. In Norwich, another officer, also in their cruiser, was shot at multiple times, hitting the windshield. The officer returned fire, but neither were shot during the incident. We're fortunate. Uh, that you know that that she wasn't hit by that original bullet. City leaders are demanding answers. 11 days ago, our police officers arrested this individual for illegal possession of a firearm. He remained out. Yesterday, he murdered somebody and attempted to assassinate a police officer. Republican lawmakers have been critical of the governor and Democrats for not doing enough on crime. They're also blaming the police accountability bill, which passed last year. They say it's working against law enforcement when police need help the most. It ties police officers' hands in a lot of ways. Um, it makes it more difficult for police officers to do their job uh, in protecting the public safety. It also at times, I think, makes it difficult for them to protect themselves in certain situations. There is nothing in that bill that prevents a police officer from defending themselves. 
Um, in fact, a lot of the provisions in that bill help to take some of the bad officers off our streets, in, which makes the good officers on our streets that much safer. Steve Sastrom is a representative who chairs the Judiciary Committee. He says there is a lot of good in the police accountability bill, which he helped craft. He says it does provide more money from the state to municipalities for things like training and other things which are very important. He says that body cameras are also included in that as well. For now, we are live at the state capitol in Hartford. Susan Rauf, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. All right, Susan, thank you very much. We are